I know you all want to hear Admiral Howard, but you got to get through me first. That was a little funny. <laughs> all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Admiral Howard, Major General Gable, um, General Williams, Lieutenant Colonels uh, McCain, Cross, President Johnson, fellow service members, veterans, friends, family, staff, and a special welcome to our soon-to-be uh, commissioned officers. Welcome to what can only be called one of the most defining moments in the lives of these young men, men and women uh, seated here before me. Uh, but before I introduce uh, our guest of honor, uh, I'd just like to take a moment to thank those individuals who spent a lot of extra time uh, putting this together. I'd like to thank um, Lieutenant Aaron Gorham. Uh, I'd like to thank Gunner Gunnery Sergeant Wilson, Staff Sergeant Garcia, and uh, Midshipman Arnold. Uh, if you think it was tough getting your son or daughter through college, imagine what it was like getting them through the last 0700 briefings this week to get ready for today's ceremony. So my hat's off to all of you for that effort. I'd also like to put a special thank, out, uh, thank you out to Dr. Lee Burge and uh, Ms. Velma Moore, without whose support and leadership and guidance over the past few years, none of these young men and women uh, would have made it to today. So thank you to, uh, to those two individuals. Now, for those of you who don't know, the commencement ceremony is, I'll call it, uh, for lack of a better word, hosted um, by a different ROTC unit uh, each year. Last year was my first year at uh, Tuskegee, and uh, I was a participant, but I wasn't the host. However, I did know that uh, in a year, I would be the host. And I sat there and I thought that, uh, I really started to put my mind to it because now it was my responsibility to co conduct an evolution that was commensurate with the rich history and tradition that is Tuskegee University, and to keep up with the standards uh, that was set by those who have hosted it before me. Plus, me being the newest of the ROTC units, I knew it was my opportunity, my one and only opportunity, to really put together an epic evolution with a great guest speaker so I could stick it to the Army and the Air Force. <laughs> and go try to top the vice chief fellas, good luck next year, because you know they're not going to. So you all made the best ceremony ever. You just don't know it yet. Um, all right, in all honesty, um, when we sat down, we knew that, it was, uh, that Admiral Howard was the ideal choice to be part of our commissioning and to be our guest of honor. The challenge was, how do you get the vice chief of naval operations down to little old Tuskegee for a, uh, for a commissioning ceremony. Can you imagine what the schedule is like while you're the Vice Chief of Naval Operations? Well, thanks to the efforts uh, of her very easy to work with staff, what it really took was us sending a simple request and then waiting and then miraculously one day we got an email back that said, Admiral Howard graciously accepts your invitation. Now, for those of you who are in uniform, who were in uniform, how often does that happen? Great big cup of never. So it is truly an honor that uh, we have her here today. And that is, again, thanks, thanks to her staff uh, and to the efforts of Lieutenant Gorham and, of course, for Admiral Howard for accepting. Now, for those of you seated out there, I encourage you to read the, uh, the bio that's in your program about Admiral Howard. As you'll do, that you'll find that she has accomplished a tremendous amount in what to us seems like a short time, but I'm sure to Admiral Howard seems like a longer time. She has had command at every level possible. She has led sailors into mar and Marines into harm's way, not once, but multiple times. Pick a hot spot around the world, and Admiral Howard has led sailors and Marines into harm's way and brought them back safely. Also, along the way, she has shattered barriers and open do doors, many way too, or too many of those to even list today, and has paved the way for future generations to follow and emulate. Right now, men and women serving in the most difficult spots around the world have had the honor and privilege of working for Admiral Howard. Simply put, she has set the gold standard for leadership, professionalism, and courage throughout all of our armed services. That is why it's my pleasure and certainly my honor to introduce the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, 
Admiral Michelle Howard. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, warm welcome. And uh, before I start my official remarks, I do want to say thank you for that warm welcome. As I have walked around campus today, so many of you have come up and said hello and introduced yourselves and probably topped off by just before coming in here, uh, Cecil and his son Jamal gave me a Tuskegee bracelet. Uh, and then for those of you in the military, you know most of our services allow us to wear one bracelet. It is not allowed to be faddish. This one, however, also happens to be red and gold, which is the Marine Corps colors. So as Vice Chief of Naval Operations, I have waived the uniform requirements for 100... <laughs> for 120 minutes so that I am wearing <laughs> the Tuskegee University bracelet. So thank you so much for that. Well, good afternoon. ROTC leadership, faculty, staff, families, fellow generals. And I must say thank you. We have um, uh, National Guard represented today. And of course, Navy doesn't have Guard. We have the Coast Guard, but it doesn't work the same way. But thank you, all both of you, for your service. And most importantly, good afternoon to the cadets and midshipmen of Tuskegee ROTC. It's my pleasure to be here, and not just here, but in this sacred place. But I'd also like to give special emphasis on welcoming our families and friends. Without our families, without you, these fine young adults, soon to be ensigns and second lieutenants, wouldn't be here. On behalf of the Navy and our fighting men and women throughout the Department of Defense, I am grateful for you, for the support you have provided these young people and continue to provide them as evidenced by your presence here today. So let me start with a story about family and about one of the first leaders in my life, my mother. My mother was raised in England in World War II, and let's just say her childhood was tough. And despite the trying times, she was a girl guide, and she continued Girl Scouting in this country after she married my father and moved here. And my father was in the Air Force, and so we spent many weeks a year camping and hiking in new places after we moved, New England, Colorado, and Alaska. My mother, my mother is a woman of absolutes. If you've heard the expression, there's no crying in baseball, my mother's version would have been, there's no crying, period. <laughs> so it's against this attitude that I and my three siblings were tested. For my mother, there was much about outdoor life that provided opportunities for us to prove character. And we were expected to carry heavy packs while scaling mountains pitch tents quickly as the sun set, and rustle up a meal over an open campfire in just minutes. And as a scout leader, my mother took none of these skills for granted. We had to prove ourselves through demonstration, and my mother, she was the sole authority as to whether we passed or failed. Among the many standards set to determine if we were capable outdoor scouts was the test of the one match fire. The one match fire. In my mother's version of outdoor life, a woodsman should be able to light a fire and have it roar into success with just a single match. And I believe her reasoning was nested somewhere in that childhood deprived time of World War II. When she grew up, matches were a precious store. And once you use them, there's no more coming. And you may have been on the run from German occupiers who have just invaded your homeland. And so each match stick represents one evening of hot meals, the basic necessity of warmth for English insurgents, or a spark that keeps the home fires burning. One match to start a fire. 
The intense tone of burden and responsibility was deeply translated to me and my siblings as we grew up. And I'll tell you, my mother's rules for final evaluation were as arbitrary and finite as life itself. On any given day of fun in the woods, she would decide, tonight, this is your moment of truth. Find your wood, stack up your best efforts, you get one match. One match. Let your hand be steady. Don't let a wind blow out that flame. Cusp your light carefully. For if it's blown out, you have failed. If your strike is off and you break your matchstick, you have failed. And should you carelessly have selected damp tinding, tinder and kindling and the wet snuffs out your blaze, you have failed. The penalties for failure were hard. You are not only probably going to have to endure the sneers of your siblings, the entire family unit failed together. If your one match fire didn't work, there was no fire that night. No singing around the cozy embers at the end of the day. No heat. No hot food for dinner. And most egregious of all, no s'mores. <laughs> In the annals of Howard family lore, it is my sister who made the record books. We were camping during a miserably cold and wet weekend in Alaska's Mount McKinley National Forest. My sister, the youngest, had just turned eight. We were spent after a long day of hiking and we were completely soaked. The sun was setting and we were looking forward to that campfire. And to this day, I do not know what wild hair crept into my mother's head and I have asked her, trust me, Stretching our belief in her sanity, she turned to my eight-year-old sister and said, it's your turn, one match fire. Recognizing the unbelievable unfairness of the circumstances, my brothers and I protested against the extreme conditions and this ridiculous challenge heaped upon my younger sister. And we were quickly silenced with a look. And realizing that civil disobedience didn't work against this woman, we scrambled with flashlights to help our sister find dry pine needles for tinder in a forest drunk with running waters. And as a team, we decided to sacrifice my older brother's poncho. We created a small shelter against the wind and rain. My two brothers and I held the poncho as close to the ground as possible and my sister gingerly paced her tinder under that temporary haven. And I will tell you, in a daring maneuver, never again seen on Outdoor Life Network, my sister crawled underneath that poncho roof, and using her body as a shield, my eight-year-old sister lit her match. And the fire started. Glory be to God. <laughs> We, we were all tipsy with the feelings that come with success against adversity, and all the more sweet because we had succeeded as a team. We pounded my sister on the back. We jumped up and down. We ran around that camp because we were winners, winners. That family narrative taught me much about life and leadership. It reinforced to me that there are consequences to failure, just as there is satisfaction when you succeed. I also learned that you don't get to pick your moment of success. You must be ready when it's thrust upon you. It taught me that as much as challenge can overwhelm you individually, challenge can be used to build a team. And as I grew older, I realized the wisdom my mother had passed on Sometimes in life, you only get one match. And when you think about the metaphors between flame, light, and inspiration, the lessons of those days have a much deeper meaning. And we frequently only get one chance in life to light a flame, to inspire. And all of you out there, all of you are eager to grab your first match and show the world what you're made of. But before you strike, I'd like to give you two thoughts before you start on that journey. 
be ready, and never give up. These two thoughts are also found on dog tags handed out during the Rise Above Red Tail Squadron traveling exhibit. And the exhibit provides students the opportunity to learn about the courage and determination of Tuskegee Airmen. And other Tuskegee principles are listed on those dog tags. Aim high, believe in yourself, use your brain and expect to win. But first, be ready to go. And being ready to go means more than just showing up in the proper uniform. It means preparing every morning it means things like setting goals and planning out your day, engaging your sol sailors, soldiers, and airmen to learn about what interests them and motivates them, and being eager for the opportunity when a senior enlisted member offers a lesson, but you're just dead tired on your feet after the midwatch. It means knowing yourself and how you can best prepare for the upcoming challenges. The Navy's first pilot, Theodore Ellison, seemed to have been ready to go. And it's fitting that I mention him because 104 years ago to this day, naval aviation was born. On May 8, 1911, naval aviation purchased its first aircraft from Mr. Glenn Curtis, the founder of U.S. aircraft industry. Theodore's desire to join the Navy began at the age of 14 when he saw a fleet of ships enter Hampton Roads, Virginia. Upon entering the Naval Academy, he asked why he joined the Navy, and he said, I saw the fleet come in. And Theodore joined the academy because he was impressed with those ships and sea power. And why ships and not planes? It was 1901, in a couple of years before the Wright brothers took their first flight. So for Theodore's first five years after graduation, he served on a number of ships to include a command assignment. Eventually, he was assigned to support the outfitting and maintenance of a submarine and dry dock in Newport News. Then his career took a dramatic turn. In December of 1910, Theodore Ellison was ordered to report to Glenn Curtis Aviation Camp in San Diego, California. Mr. Glenn Curtis offered the Navy an opportunity to instruct a naval officer in the operation and construction of his aircraft as a means to develop and support military operations. So imagine. Imagine what it would be like to be ordered to do something no one else has ever been ordered to do. Ellison did not have other naval aviators to ask about their experiences. He did not have a pilot mentor. He, he did have his professional and leadership experiences from his time at the academy and his shipboard assignments. Theodore Ellison was ready to go. Theodore partnered with Curtis and soon became part of the many naval aviation first. In addition to becoming the first naval aviator, he prepared the first pre-flight checklist. He was the first to advocate for special flight clothing. So he was, of course, the first to fly a naval airplane. And he may have been the first aviator to have a call sign and eventually became known as Spuds. So Spuds was the first to land at night on water and the first to be launched from an experimental catapult system. His wife once said that Spuds liked being first, and he pushed himself to do it. And he said, he's always about something that somebody else hasn't done yet. His military career of 27 years seemed to be consistently about being ready. And despite his trailblazing career in aviation during World War I, Ellison was assigned back to sea duty in a submarine chaser squadron. And he was awarded the Navy Cross for distinguished service in the development of successful tactics for his squadron, continuing to be ready and to be first. Spud's drive was not just about being ready to accomplish all those firsts. It was much bigger than that. He helped the Navy be ready for a new domain and war fighting capability that came to the forefront in World War II, air power. When you're ready, you can propel your organization to success. So be ready when your match is handed to you. My second message comes from the tagline of one of history's greatest movies, Galaxy Quest. Never give up, never surrender. Roughly translated, never quit. You have overcome many challenges to get to this day. And perhaps challenges in your officer training, challenges in your personal life, or challenges in your academic life. And when you receive your commission, the challenges will continue. And everybody has challenges. Ensigns and second lieutenants, admirals and generals. 
It is part of life. On those days when the obstacles seem high, don't quit. Keep going. Afterwards, reassess your situation, learn from those experiences, and remain committed to getting it right. One executive corporate leader asked a question, what would you do if you weren't afraid? What she was talking about is courage. Courage is a core value to all of our service, and whether you find yourself in an office or on the battlefield, keep the courage to face your challenges and never give up. And the principle to never give up was clearly embodied by Tuskegee Airman John Lear. John passed away this past March at the age of 84, 94. In his honor, I'd like you to offer a glimpse of his leadership. John's right leg was permanently injured at age seven, but that did not stop him. He did what he could to overcome his physical challenges. So when Tuskegee University was ordered, awarded the U.S. Army Air Corps contract to help train America's first black military aviators, John Lear became a Tuskegee Airman. And by the time the war had ended, he had 132 combat missions, logging over 329 hours of combat flying time. As an African American born in 1921, he faced racial challenges throughout his life, but he never gave up. Whether in a Cincinnati elementary school as the only black child of 41 kids in Miss Pritchell's third grade class, or while serving in a segregated military, John Lair never gave up. John has said, don't let anyone tell you you can't do something. If you're determined enough, you can overcome anything. Even after surviving the engagements of racism growing up in the combat of World War II, John continued leading, this time leading younger generations with an unexpected lifelong friend. During a military reunion in 1977, John Lear swapped stories with another World War II Army Corps pilot, Herb Hillebron. They quickly became best of friends. And although Herb was not a Tuskegee Airman, they discovered that John flew two missions as fighter escort for Herb's bomber. Then more amazing, they realized that 69 years earlier, they were both in Miss Pritchell's third grade class. Herb went home, found an old third grade class photo, and sure enough, Herb and John are standing side by side. Well, they continued to stand side by side after that for decades sharing their story over and over at schools. And their message was, we all have the same needs and goals. Respect each other. Fight racism. And as I learned at Mount McKinley, challenge can be the bond that forms and brings a team together. And just as my brothers and my sister started that fire, John Lair and Herb Hellebron became a team, best of friends, that use their challenges to inspire others with their story and message. Through your leadership example, by never quitting, by steaming ahead on steady course, you will have the opportunity to inspire. In a few moments, you will receive your oath and become commissioned officers in our Navy, our Army, and our Air Force. Leadership is about to take on a new meaning for you so be ready and never give up. As John Quincy Adams once said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. You are about to embark on an incredible journey. And when you are handed your one match, will you be ready? Will you stay the course? Will you dream? Will you learn? Will you be more? The challenge is now. Here's your match. It's time for you to lead. Thank you.